Welcome to the How SolidWorks Handles Sheet Metal webcast. My name is Bill Mitchell, and I'll be going through this webcast today. So we'll go ahead and um, take a look at some of the things we're going to discuss. Uh, the scope of this webcast is a basic overview of sheet metal tools within SolidWorks 2011 and its capabilities. Uh, we're going to cover multi-sheet metal bodies in a single part file, designing sheet metal parts in the context of an assembly or a kind of a top-down design method. We're going to take a look at how flat patterns are created for drawings and 2D exports. And then we'll also take a look at uh, forming tools and some of the utilities that come with SolidWorks standard, specifically um, DFM Express, which has uh, some utilities to review design for manufacturability issues. So before we get too far into it, let's uh, some of the, the methods that you can use to design sheet metal parts within SolidWorks are to start with just a basic flat sheet or sketch and then insert bins from there using um, you know, edge flanges, miter flanges, hems, those types of just regular sheet metal tools. Another approach would be to start with a solid body, whether it be just an extruded rectangle or whatever, and then use the convert to sheet metal functionality um, to convert it into a multi-sheet metal or multi-body sheet metal part. And then a third approach would be to create or uh, obtain an imported body and then insert bins. Um, some of the ground rules that you need to be aware of as far as the sheet metal requirements for SOLIDWORKS is that the parts need to be uniform thickness and that the geometry needs to be a developable surface, meaning that it must be able to be flattened without any sort of stretching or folding. So something that would need to be formed or hammered into place probably would not be a good candidate for a sheet metal part, or at least you would have to do some different tweaks to get the, um, the functionality to work. But with that said, um, utilities like a sheet metal loft can get around a lot of those types of things without having to um, to actually go into a, a surface or a, a sheet metal body that can't be flattened. So for the first part we're going to cover, let's go ahead and create a new part file. And I'll say on the front plane, create a sketch. So once I've got a sketch, and keep in mind this isn't a closed volume, this is just kind of, you know, three different lines. If I go into Base Flange and Tab, notice that it does project the depth, almost like a thin feature sketch would inside of SolidWorks. I can tell that I want to use a gauge table, or I can define the thickness myself. If I like the gauge table, there are a number of um, kind of out-of-the-box tables that we can reference. I'm just going to accept a uh, standard aluminum, maybe make this a 16-gauge material. I can also put in my bend radius, or I can override it if I need to. Um, K factor and auto reliefs are also part of that uh, table. And now, as far as my direction, I'll say it's going to be uh, three inches. So now you can see that I've got a, a sheet metal part, sheet metal feature, base flange, and then always at the end of a SolidWorks sheet metal part is going to be a flat pattern feature that's suppressed. If I select that, you can see that I get a phantom edge of what the basic profile of this part is going to be whenever it's in its flattened state. In my feature tree, I also have a folder called cut list. If I update this, see that it takes on the icon of a sheet metal part and a base flange. So now if I want to add more features, I can go ahead and uh, certainly do that. I'm going to add a uh, miter flange. If I select the Propagate tool, you can see that it's going to run all the way around. And it's going to go ahead and uh, make those three, three tabs on the outside of my part. Then if I want to go ahead and put some holes in, I can do that with a hole wizard hole, or I can just select this, come to my sheet metal, put a simple hole in, maybe say that it's going to be um, 100 thou. Another approach would actually be to create a whole wizard feature if I wanted to designate maybe a particular screw clearance. Come into hole. 
screw clearance for maybe eighth inch. Following this methodology, I can also place more holes at once, and it gives me greater control over where those holes are going to be. Say these are horizontal to each other. So now I've got a hole. And you can see that, that one is more descriptive than the other, so I would trend towards the whole, whole wizard feature. Now suppose that I want to put a bend or put a hole through a bend. Um, rather than trying to have to create a reference plane, shoot the hole through the part, and then have to live with a distortion or even something that couldn't particularly, you know, maybe not even be capable of being flattened, I can use a sheet metal tool called Unfold. I can select my fixed face, what bend I want to flatten, and then that flattens just that particular bend at that point, I can create a sketch. Say if I want to maybe put a rectangular slot through here. One of the unique features um, of a sheet metal part is the ability to link to, think to, link to thickness. And so what that's going to do is um, go back up to the sheet metal feature and determine how thick it is so that the, the extrude depth will always be um, linked to the material thickness. This is different than through all because if you put another sheet metal feature on the back side, um, through all is going to intersect that, whereas um, link to thickness is very similar to maybe an up to next condition and in condition. So I'm going to go ahead and fold this, collect all my bends, and if I look really closely at specifically these uh, bends here, you can see that the face is actually representative of the bend versus just being a straight cut. Now if I flatten my part, I can always select flatten, gives me a flat pattern, shows me the bend lines. So you can make pretty quickly make a sheet metal part. Um, if I come into my cut list, if I right click on a cut list item, go to its properties. I get a lot of information about my sheet metal part. For its instance, I've got a bounding box length and width, so this tells me how big um, of material it's going to be, sheet metal thickness, cutting length outer and inner, so these are basically the linear, un linear units of uh, however many, you know, the perimeter of the part, both inside and outside, number of cuts, bends, the bend allowance, material, mass, um, description, and so on. So if I go ahead and add a material, so I, have, I want this to be made out of plain carbon steel, then if I come back into my cut list items, you can see now that the mass has been re it's been updated as has the material. So one of the items that we were going to cover is uh, exporting the flat pattern. From this point, I can right click, export the DXF, give this a name. SOLIDWORKS gives me the opportunity to select sheet metal, faces, loops, edges, and so on. I can include the bend lines, although most more often than not, whenever you export a DXF file for a sheet metal, you just want the actual geometry. If there's a particular vector that I want to use to align my 0, 0, I can do that at this point. Let's go ahead and say OK. And then I'll see that I get a preview of the sheet metal part. So this is what the DXF file is going to look like. Now supposing that this particular hole is something that's going to be put in maybe after it's formed or something that I don't want to include in my DXF file. So I can just select maybe those holes. Remove those entities. So now that those entities are going to be pulled out of my DXF export, they're still part of my original model, but it allows me to kind of clean up any information that I may not necessarily want to send out to the laser or water jet. Another method for creating sheet metal parts, cancel that, cancel this, is um, 
using a convert to sheet metal. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. Don't worry about saving that. And then I'll make another part. And say, for instance, on this particular part, I'm going to do something a little bit. Maybe create an extruded part. keep this very simple. I'm not going to worry about overdefining my sketch, but I'll just go ahead and create an extrude. So now I've got a solid. Now if I wanted to make a sheet metal equivalent of this particular part, I could very easily do that with a sheet metal tool. Convert the sheet metal. I can select my flat face. I did. I made a mistake. I'm going to go ahead and pull these fillets out. Okay, so coming back into this, the reason I pulled those out is because my f my sheet metal part uh, needs to be able to navigate those bins. So you can see what I've done is selected the fixed face, and then anywhere that I want a bin to be located, I can use a gauge table again. If I come back in, notice that it deleted the original body. If I come back in and edit this feature, I can tell it to keep the body so that I can keep on uh, building a sheet metal equivalent of this box. So I'm going to select this bottom face. So now at this point, I'm going to go back to this last one, tell it that I don't want to keep the body, and so now I've got a sheet metal part if I do a section view through this. See that it starts out. I've got a box tube on the inside. So now if I want to add a weld to this, I can come in to my weldment section, create a weld bead, say that I want a weld bead between these two members. and I get a cosmetic weld along with an annotation of my model. I can always make this plain carbon steel. Maybe do the same thing on the inside of this. And so I could go ahead and continue building that around. So now I've got five different sheet metal pieces. Any one of them I can right click on this, toggle flat display, and it's going to show me a phantom view of what that's going to look like in its flattened state. But you can see now if I come back to my original part, make any changes to it, something like that, maybe pull this back a little bit. Then I box update. So this is a little bit more of um, 
for simple parts, this is kind of a quick method for going through and creating um, a sheet metal, almost a sub-assembly. This is all within a single part file. If I come and update my cut list, you can see that I've got different items and it does recognize that the items on the sides are the same. At any point I can go in and look at my properties for each one of my cut list items. I can also look at the property summary. So if I want to know what the uh, you know cutting length is for each item, number of cutouts for each item, and then also get a cut list table that I can customize this if I want to. Now if there's anything that I want to leave out of my cut list, for example, uh, maybe cut list item four is something that I want to exclude for whatever reason, I can always come back into my properties and say for cut list item four, I want to exclude that from my cut list. It does give me a note saying that that item's been excluded. So there is full adjustability uh, and customization available for this cut list table. Um, so that's, that's the other method, um, creating from a solid body, creating multiple sheet metal parts. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at creating the items in the context of an assembly. So I go ahead and start a new component. And I'll start on this back face. I'm going to go ahead and switch to a wireframe view so that I can see everything that I'm doing. Now notice that because I've created a part in the context of an assembly, I have a virtual component. You can tell that it's a virtual component because it's in brackets. I'm going to go ahead and start a sketch. Maybe do a um, something like this. So doing this method is called, you know, defining it in the context of this assembly. A little bit of material between these two, or a little bit of gap between this, those two, maybe 100 thou. So whenever I define things in, in an assembly like this, should these components ever change, then these dimension values are also going to change. Now I'll go ahead and make this a, a construction line but I do want the bottom edge of this to always be a half inch off the bottom of that floppy drive. So coming back into my sheet metal tool, again using base flange, you can see which side of the material is going to be set in. It's a gauge table. You can see that with the phantom view, because I'm 100 thousandths over, I'm still going to clear the corner of that part. And now this is where, th this next step is where the value of doing things in the context of an assembly makes sense. So at this point, I don't really know what the extrude depth is for this particular component, but I can always say up to surface. And what that allows me to do is select the surface of another part. You can see I might have an interference issue here. It just barely fits. So now if I select this, I can maybe change this value to fit in the inside or the outside. So it clears the fill of that part. There we go. So now coming back around, I can also ensure that my component is going to have proper clearance to mount. So if I select on this edge, again with a miter flange, now if I want to go ahead and put holes into this part, I've got two holes there. So if I select this face, Go ahead and create a sketch. Switch back to wireframe mode. And then I can, since I'm in a sketch, I can use the Convert Entities tool to convert the edges of those circles that are in the other, in, on the other component to sketch geometry. Go ahead and apply a cut, length of thickness. 
And now you can see that the sheet metal component is defined in the context of the assembly. If I look at the features, anytime I see a dash greater than symbol next to a feature name, that's indicating that that's an in-context relationship. And I can always inspect that and see what the relationship is. So that's uh, related to the other parts. And so that is kind of a, a very quick view of um, in-context design. Let's take a look at what happens if I take this same part, let me open this up, and if I save this out as a parasolid file, just to get a neutral file format. Now if I open up that file, Solid is where select that part. So now it comes in as just a regular dumb solid body. I'll go ahead and run import diagnostics on it to make sure everything's sound. So now if I want to make use of this and be able to create a flat pattern, I can come to my sheet metal tool and to simply select insert bins. When I insert bins, it asks me to select a fixed face. So I'll select that face. And that's going to be about it. I'm going to designate my bin radius. So I'll say I want this to be a 60 thou. So now what it does is it goes through and analyzes my model, gets all the different bins, processes them, and gives me a flat pattern, which is a lot faster than having to redo that by myself. Um, the last thing to cover is um, taking a look at, at um, forming features. So coming back into this part, within my design library, I've got a number of features, forming tools, so I go design library, forming tools. If I right click on that forming tools folder, I'm going to see a designator that says forming tools. As long as there's a check mark here, then the forming tool functionality is going to work. Um, whenever I drag and drop a forming tool into a part, it looks at the part file. Internal of the forming tool files are stop faces, colored faces, and so on. That will help determine how these uh, forming tools actually displace. So what I'm going to do is just drag and drop this onto a part. If I go into sketch tools, too thick. Okay, let me try a different type of body. Try that one. So you can see that whenever I do this, what a forming tool does, let me get rid of this louver that was failing. What a forming tool does is it looks at the material, it has a cutout, and then it displaces it. So if I come back into my sheet metal part, If I look at this component part, it has a number of yellow faces and then a red face. So the red face, whenever the forming tool feature is dropped into a SOLIDWORKS part, um, rather than trying to create a copy of itself, it looks at this and says, okay, this is a material that I'm going to remove. It takes in the material thickness and then displaces the material. So some of the rules on that is that, or that the, um, the curvature and the geometry basically has to be in place. Um, it has to be able to displace the material without creating some sort of um, self-intersecting condition. I can also pattern these, so if I want to take these, edit this feature. Go ahead and select this, go to features, linear pattern, give it a direction. And I can also mirror both of those. So that is the uh, sheet metal features. Um, hopefully you got something out of this. Although the last thing that I was gonna gonna look at, pardon me, was the uh, DFM Express. So what DFM Express does? If I go to Tools, DFM Express. 
and go to settings. I can designate a lot of different things, but as it pertains to sheet metal, I can select sheet metal as an option. Some of the things that uh, DFM Express is going to check is the hole diameter to thickness ratio, simple hole part edge distance. So it means if I've got a hole that is very close to the edge of a part, and I'll, I'll create a, si a situation where this fails, it'll flag it. Um, hole spacing, countersinks, recommended bin radiuses. And then also I can define standard hole sizes. This would be useful, say, if you have a, a punch and you want to make sure that the model that you're going to be running is going to have a, a corresponding punch size. You can use this utility to analyze your model to make sure that everything is, is going to work correctly. So I'm just going to run with the default rules. So looking at the model. So you can see that the recommended bin radius it says a general guideline is to keep the inside radius approximately equal to the material thickness. If I select that, it shows me all the different bin radiuses where it violates that rule or that suggestion. And then the standard hole sizes, because it's not a list, those holes are not part of my, let me pin this open those holes are not part of my standard set, it highlights them. So if I go ahead and close that, come back into my, so those holes are going to be four millimeters. If I come back into my DFM Express, go to my settings, edit my standard hole sizes, So you can see that's standard English and metric. So now if I rerun this, so the only thing that fails is the bin radius, which is we were aware of to begin with. So one other thing that we can cover would be the um, using lofted sheet metal features. So I'm going to go ahead and create a, another new part. And then let's take a look at um, how to create something like a lofted sheet metal part. So the first thing would be to create a couple of reference planes, create a sketch. Maybe make this a 4x4. Four square now one of the things that um, is unique to loft is not really unique but one of the requirements is that you have to have some bins and then a split so I'm going to put some sketch fillets in here and then I'm also going to create a center line down the center and I'm going to use this as a means to offset so I'm going to offset bi-directional I'll say it's going to be 15 thou in a direction and then what this allows me to do, uh, these guys need to be construction. And then I'm going to come in here and trim this up a little bit. So I've got one side of my loft. And what I'm going to do is go from a square to a circle, something that is fairly common, or one of the things that we get a lot of requests for is, you know, how do I do that? So we're going to go same thing. Now in order to make this work a little bit easier and just to locate things so that I've got a clean seam, I'm going to use convert entities on these two sketches, those two sketch entities, so that if those locations ever change, then this uh, circle is also going to change. I'm going to select those two lines I just made, and then I'm going to trim up the inside. Oops. Try this again. Trim. So now another thing to, to notice is that for however many points I have in one sketch, 
it's typically a good idea to have the same number of points in the corresponding sketch that it's going to mate to or that it's going to align with. So I can use split entities and it doesn't necessarily have to be exact but so long as that for every node in one profile there's a node in another profile you'll probably get a reasonably good result and if you need to you can always uh, you know pin this in with uh, sketch relations and dimensions but for the scope of what we're doing right now this should this should be fine pull this in just a little bit there so now that I've got two separate sketches what I can easily do is go into sheet metal loft select from one to the other and you can see that it's going to give me a loft I can select my sheet metal thickness say that's going to be 0.06 if I zoom in closely I can also tell it what direction the loft is going to be in so you can see from that final line it's going to be inset versus outset so now you can see that I've got a reasonably good flat pattern Now if I ever make a change to this, I can just come back into my sketches. Perhaps make this just a little bit smaller. You can see that it updates. So that is, um, that's a, a, another feature that you can do with um, SolidWorks Sheet Metal, is the lofted sheet metal bend. Um, I think that's going to go ahead and, and conclude what I have for this webcast. There are a lot more features available, but um, a lot of them require you know, just a little bit of, of time and stuff to, to set these things up. If you have any questions or if there's anything that you'd want to see, please visit us at ddicad.com. Um, we've got a support submission for, you know, su for tech support. You can also email us at support at ddicad.com. Thanks for watching.